you know, let's do this because we've been sort of bouncing around Sabat and we should kind of give a little intro on that. This will this will be a podcast where we cover all the theories of atherosclerosis. Uh, so I mentioned the outside in, there's already lots of talks on this. I'm going to do my best to keep it from getting too technical. Yeah. But going back to my visualization, I'm looking at the camera again, you know, we've got the lumen again, we've got the endothelial cells, and then huh, there's so many different ways to break down what the tissue is below here. We're kind of loosely just saying subintimal space, right? There's there's actually multiple types of layers and a lot of things to discuss there. But importantly, subintimal space is where you could say the atherosclerosis appears. And then this is an observation that Sabatin introduced that was new to me at the time that I was reading it from him, which is that what's usually described is that this is one layer of endothelial cells, exactly one cell layer thick. They're, they're uh, long and they look almost like shingles if you're doing a cross section. What he said is, no, actually, they may start that way when you're really young, but they ultimately lay, they ultimately thicken to extra additional endothelial cells. And this is referred to DIT or diffuse intimal thickening. Okay. Now, down below in the subintimal space, there are these teensy tiny vessels. I mean, much, much smaller than the lumen that's above. And like I said, smaller uh, uh, molecules and macromolecules are going in through there and can help supply uh, nutrients to the endothelial cells. And to be sure, I don't know you know, what fits, what doesn't fit, but most of those kinds of things, like you were talking about albumin, for example, I think albumin fits there as well. And I believe that um, uh, certain sizes, I don't know how, how up, up the sizes go, of ApoB-containing lipoproteins can fit there. And the staining that he was showing, he was showing these cross sections with staining. He was pointing out how there are what appears to be a collection of uh, ApoB-containing lipoproteins. I think it was specifying LDL. We don't know for sure, but that they seem to be accumulating down low and then slowly moving up until you see the atheroma appear up here. <laughs> so in other words, suggesting that indeed the origin of atherosclerosis is near the vasovasorum and that some kind of disruption or infarct or something like that where it creates a problem here is where we end up with those problems that appear up here. Mm -hmm. right. Correct me. Uh, this is like yeah. me kind of going back from memory, I want to say like five, six years, but that's the gist, would yeah. you say? Yeah. And, and I would just point out that what he's saying is that it starts with a response of the endothelia. Something causes a proliferative response that causes the vase of sorum to make these changes and grow new things and causes whatever's happening in the subintimal space. Right. Right. So that could be these changes in blood flow, like Richard Thoma and Meritex in her highlight. It could also be injury, right? Yes. Now, here's where we're going to go. We're going to wrap in what has been more widely accepted since 2020, the same EAS group that gave us the famous 2017 uh, low density lipoproteins cause atherosclerosis, the three line graph that we all are very familiar with. Mm -hmm. They had a second paper that was in the works from the beginning that was a mechanisms paper. And that ended up shifting the whole field, or I should say the major voices in the field of lipidology to um, more broadly agree that actually transcytosis is the major contributor to ApoB lipoproteins in the subintimal space. And that was a huge shift because literally all this time, it's been assumed it's a passive process by how they get in there, that they are smashing into the endothelial walls or that they're getting through the junction gaps. And this isn't to say that they aren't getting through the junction gaps, which we can get into a little bit later, but I've long believed, long before that 2020 paper was published, and I have tweets, I've, I've got receipts <laughs> of where I was saying transcytosis is how, I think I literally said, we, we can't crack open the book of atherosclerosis until we're looking at transcytosis. That's relevant when talking about the Sabatin work, because mm -hmm. do I think those LDL particles there in the subintimal space there's a strong case to be made that they were literally put there by the endothelial cells above. Yes, not only yes, but now that same 2020 paper I'm talking about and lots of research since 
shows that inflamed endothelial cells express more receptors such as SRB1, which transcytose LDL particles down, which incidentally, to me, should have been one of those moments where, and I don't want to, I don't want to sound too strong here, but I'm just going to say it, the field of lipidology should have like slowed down for a sec and said, wait a second, this is a planned process. This is literally part of the playbook of inflammation at an endothelial cell level. Why don't we start looking a bit closer as to what that is? It definitely threw a lot, I think, objectively. It throws more support towards the response to injury hypothesis at a minimum and makes it even more incumbent that you be able to disengage, disentangle whether or not there is an injury or some inflammation of the endothelial cell as relevant toward the development of atherosclerosis where it appears. Because right now, there's still a push that it's, no, yeah, there is a, a response to injury, we agree. It's not, um, it's not uh, mutually exclusive of the response to retention hypothesis, which I would agree with. They don't, they don't have to be. But in order to stand on the response to retention hypothesis, you ideally want to get a population of people with sky-high LDL but who are not chronically inflamed, mm -hmm. ideally, as a good test ground, right? Mm -hmm. And so that, that's, that's why like, it was a big deal to me that that came around. Well, so this comes back to the relevance of the vasovasorum and Sabatin's work. Again, I, I like all of the hypotheses. I like to chat about all of them. But once I saw that inflamed in the endothelial cells did this increased level of transcytosis, that then put the same requirement on Sabatin. Mm -hmm. How do you disentangle the injured endothelial cells? In, and I think he had a version of response to injury effectively, mm -hmm. effectively, in that it's not diffuse. It's not all across the... Because that was always going to be a problem with the response to retention is you would expect that there would be a distribution that's a lot more predictable. Right. Right. Um, but no, there there isn't. To be fair, and I want to be as fair as I can to those who are response to retention enthusiasts, I'm sure they would agree that, um, or I'm sure they would say, look, there also is mechanical stress, hemodynamics, those sorts of things are contributors. Mm -hmm. But... Do we see do we see a wider Gaussian distribution of plaque as we would expect to see with the response to retention? Not to a level that that you know convinces me at this point. Yeah, and and I think that things can end up in the submental space in that way too. I would just take it even further than that. Like before that can happen, you have to have destruction of structured water. You have to have possibly. You have to get rid of it, like because otherwise nothing can penetrate it. There's no transcytosis happening until that damage happens, and they send out signals, more receptors, to say, "Hey, we need help." That I'm pretty sure you're wrong on. It's th this is a I, I love the structured water hypothesis, but I'm I'm very very confident. Let's just say that there is receptor mediated uh, capture of things from the lumen by endothelial cells, and definitely one of those is what I just described, transcytosis of lipoproteins from the lumen into the subatomal space. In a normal, healthy person. In a normal, healthy person. I said that it- Define healthy. Yeah, well, no, no. I said that uh, uh, damaged endothelial cells upregulate things like SRB1. Mm -hmm. But under normal conditions, SRB1 does still capture um, ApoB lipoproteins. From where? From the lumen. We know from the lumen for sure? Yes. Like in other words- Let's say that I, um, let's say I took a biopsy of, you know, your cellular matter mm -hmm. and I looked inside these cells, the endothelial cells of a portion of tissue where I pulled the, um, and I looked at all of them and I then checked out the mRNA, right? So I could actually see the transcription, et cetera. I'm pretty confident that I would find that SRB1 was in production and possibly even see existing receptors and possibly even see existing vesicles. However, you just took that tissue out of its natural environment. True, but I'm I'm so I I don't think you can say that because that's that's an injury. You just caused an injury. You just cut. You just rocked that cell's world. Okay, fair enough. Let's say if I cultured cells, right? I'll, I'll bet it. 
that's granted and, and I want to be you know clear mm-hmm. um, I know that there are in vitro studies that I'd read with regard to SRB1 and it's it is still an emerging field and I'll I'll be a front that in vitro could you know be more induced and is not as um, reliable as in vivo mm-hmm. but all that said I would bet you yeah. And and for that matter, there's another, there's kind of a larger structural, I'm not going to, I'm going to get off on a tiny tangent. I think in the case of lean mass hyperspondrous, there's a greater, greater degree of transcytosis by endothelial cells to meet structural demands. So for example, how um, adipocytes grow and contract, right? Contract, I shouldn't be used. I should just say shrink. But in particular, they need to uh, increase their surface area at a point where there's storage. A lot of that's just even routine storage, just tiny bits. But where do they get that surface area, like free cholesterol and um, um, phospholipids? I believe that there's a certain degree of it that's made use of by, ex- by existing ApoB lipoproteins. Now, could they all be supplied by the vasophosphorum? Maybe. But then why would they make these receptors for transcytosis and endocytosis in this case? Which is where they literally ingest it and then make use of them. Yeah, uh, we'll yeah. see. I mean, we'll agree to disagree. I mean, I, I think it all comes from the mesosome because I think that because it doesn't make sense to me that that things would have to slow down enough to be transcytose. Like it, we're, like the purpose of moving blood through an artery is to keep it moving, and when it doesn't move very well, we get issues. Right, stagnant stagnant blood creates issues. That comes back to the mass. So in the case of People B lipoproteins, they're relatively small. They're easy to snag in a receptor like an LDL receptor. Now, when you do get to something like a monocyte, that's a whole different story. It's got a lot more mass, so you have to use things like VCAM. That's, uh, for for lack of a better way of putting it, that's the, the cell walls version of speed bumps. It's like slowing it down and then grabbing it and then pulling it into the uh, junction gap so that I can differentiate into a macrophage. Those are definitely not coming through the vas- vasovasorum. Like I said, I don't know the, the lumen size of the vasovasorum, but monocytes are not flowing through there. That that much I'm sure of. Sure. And if structured water exists, none of that's happening. I think it's possible that you may find out after this podcast that I'm right, but that that doesn't disqualify the structured water. Sure. Concept. I mean, how do we know anything's for, for certain? You know? We just keep <laughs> right. asking questions. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's all fun to ask. 